engaged twice to the same lady. She couldn't get enough of me and just put it out there. So glad to be in Biola this morning, which is afternoon on my time, and I, I wanted to reflect on the book of Joel, or Hoel, chapter one, verses two to four. I'm just going to give you a, a summary of it, and hopefully in your reading and your reflection. Joel begins with a negative story. It says everything that the cutting locusts the swarm, have left, the swarming locusts have taken over, and what the swarming locusts have left, the hopping locusts have left over. In other words, whatever one crisis or ca catastrophe left over, the next catastrophe demolished. I, I am living right now from crisis to crisis. I live in, in Orlando, Florida. I moved there two years ago from New York, and I just wanna say, we'll get you next year, the Yankees I'm talking about, and go Dodgers. Um, and we've just had Hurricane Irma go through, and I'm from Puerto Rico, and they just had Hurricane Maria go through, and two weeks ago I was in Houston, Texas, and they had Hurricane Harvey go through, and here in California, there are the, the wildfires, and it just seems just, just as you're getting through or over something, uh, something else is coming, and that, and that can produce sentiments, so that can produce feelings, and not, not just natural catastrophes, but there's, there's civil unrest, there's incivility, there, there's strife, there's hostility. We seem to be talking past each other or at each other, uh, but never with each other. And so I think the gospel has something to say about this, about this, this swarm of hostility and anxiety and fear. And I submit to you, whether for your acceptance or rejection, and they only gave me, you know, uh, 20 minutes, and I'm Puerto Rican and Pentecostal, and so in 20 minutes, we just get through the names of Jesus in, uh, in a prayer. Lily of the valleys, Rose of Sharon, Bright and Morning Star, which it's the introduction to a prayer. Uh, but I was, I was trained reformed, so I when you're Pentecostal, 18 minutes, is not long enough when you're trained reform, you wonder what are you gonna do with the next 15 minutes? <laughs> I'm not confused, I'm just integrated. I'm a Jersey boy, I was born in New Jersey in the Jersey Shore of Puerto Rican parents and my whole life I've had to navigate my hybrid existence, my multiple realities. Uh, English is my first language and I'm bicultural and I'm bilingual. I speak English and I speak Spanish and I'm Pentecostal, I speak other things. The Pentecostals in the room got that. And what, what I've been working with, Hispanic Heritage Month just finished. It's that special month in the US from September 15th to October 15th. It's that special month of Hispanic Heritage Month. And, and I've been talking in colleges and universities about these feelings of hostility and anger. And one person came up to me and said, well, Pastor Gabe, how, how do you navigate that? How do you help young people, instead of becoming part of the problem, become part of the solution? And I told him a story about, I'm a father of two boys. My oldest son is 12, my youngest son is eight. And my, my youngest son loves watching wrestling. Anybody watch wrestling? The fake kind, not the Greco-Roman, the, the WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. And his favorite wrestler is a guy named John Cena. Okay. And John Cena was the champion or is the champion and he, he has a finishing move. And right before he finishes you off, he stands over your body whom he just slammed to the ground. He looks at you and he, he wipes his hand in front of his face and he says, what did you say? You can't see me. Well, literally I can, you're standing right over my body, but okay. He says, you can't see me. He runs over the rope, he drops his leg on him or a five knuckle shuffle or whatever that thing is and he pins him. I submit to you that the reason we mistreat each other is because the locust of indifference has invaded our lives. Two months ago, I was flying to San Diego, 
And from Orlando to San Diego is about a six hour flight and I was exhausted. And right when we were about to land, the captain gets on the microphone and he says, ladies and gentlemen, which no one could ever understand, ladies and gentlemen, we can't land. And I was like, oh no, six hours. Because there's fog on the ground and we can't see the runway. Words a passenger on an airplane never wants to hear. And he says, we're gonna go around two or three times, but if, if the fog doesn't dissipate, we're gonna land, and here's the other word I didn't wanna hear, at LAX. <laughs> and so after a six hour flight, we landed in LAX, and then we had to take a bus from Los Angeles to San Diego. And then, I got in about one o'clock in the morning and chapel started at quarter to nine. It was not my best sermon. I submit to you the reason we can't land is because we can't see each other. Locust blinds us. And we, instead of trying to understand each other like the gospel requires of us, we see over each other or pass each other. The locusts, when they land, they blind everything in their sight. And the only reason we can mistreat each other, be indifferent to each other's pain, is because we can't see each other. And I don't mean literally. I mean we don't know each other's stories. The other day I was reading a book called Hillbilly Elegy. It's about white people living in Appalachia, in rural Appalachia, who are suffering with extreme poverty, and some of the babies are drinking Mountain Dew, they're drinking Mountain Dew from a bottle, and it rots their teeth. And then I see about what's happening to First Nations people, or Native Americans, or Asian Pacific Islanders, or Latinos, or African Americans, and when we're all caught up in our own pain, it becomes difficult to see somebody else's pain. And we need revival. Revival is the capacity to see beyond me. Most of us live in a selfie generation. Anybody ever taken a selfie? Yeah. Why don't we have pictures called otheries? Why are we self so involved with taking pictures of ourselves? It's because one of the locus of our generations is selfishness. It's all about me. All I care about is my suffering. And I'm here to tell you, Biola, that in the midst of our suffering and in the midst of our anxiety, the gospel doesn't call us just to think about ourselves. It calls us to think about somebody else. And for us to be able to think about somebody else, to overcome the locus of blindness and blind indifference to somebody else's difference, you got to ask that question that that famous prophet Marvin Gaye asked. What's going on? You've got to want to know somebody's story, what they're going through, what their suffering is, what their victories. Whenever I visit somebody, the first thing I ask them, instead of dropping my biography or my resume, the first thing I ask them is, let me know about you. What's your story? What's your history? What's your family like? And the only way gospel people and Christian universities and Christian students, whether they're doing a BA in psychology or biology or sports medicine or, or mathematics, the only way we can change the world is when we stop looking solely at ourselves. The gospel is always about somebody else. The gospel is always about the other. And so, that famous singer, Anna Mae, she asked a question, you might know her as Tina Turner. Oh, what's love got to do, got to do, got to do with it? Oh, what's love but a secondhand emotion? She had no idea. But you're welcome. I'll be here all day. Ya voy para allá, ya voy para allá. The reason people ask what's love got to do with it is because when they've been hurt, the reason Tina Turner asked what's love got to do with it is because she had lived for more than 10 years in a relationship of domestic abuse and she had been mistreated by her then husband, Ike Turner. 
And when people are beating you and mistreating you and ignoring you and saying you're not smart enough because you're a woman or you're not smart enough because you're from a racial ethnic group or because you have a physical challenge and they other you, it is the locus of killing love. It's the locus of hostility. It's the locus that says, I'm more important than you are. It is the locus of selfishness. And the antidote to selfishness is love. Love is not a feeling, folks. Love is not a feeling. Love is a decision. Love is you decide to enter into somebody's life and somebody's pain and somebody's challenge even if they're nothing like you. John chapter one from the message says, and the word became flesh and it moved into our neighborhood. Love is action. And let me tell you, I, I went to seminary and I went to a reform seminary and the first thing they told me was, Gabriel, for my preaching class, Gabriel, this is, this is your spot right here. This is your spot. Because you can't move. When you're preaching to people, you need to respect their space. So don't, you can move from here to here because if you move from this space, you're violating their space. I said, well, that's very Western of you. You know I'm Puerto Rican, right? And I move around. And on top of being Puerto Rican, I'm Pentecostal. So a Puerto Rican Pentecostal telling him this is his space. Eso es problemático, hay problemas. And so one day, I said, they said, and, and there has, there's a reason to it, I'm not opposed to it, there's a good reason. The reason is that the word is above us and it comes to us, and so God is always transcending, God is always above us, and so that has its internal logic. But there's another reason to get down off that pulpit, because the word became flesh. If you want to change the world, you have to take the risk of love in motion. And so one day, my reform professor, he was, he's Dutch, he's my good friend for the last 25 years, I said, I'm, I'm going to try something. I, I don't know if I'm going to get an F in preaching, but I'm going to try it anyway. And in the middle of the sermon, I get off the pulpit. And I said, I'm going to hug you. He was like, you're going to do what? Okay. I said, yes, I'm gonna hug you. He says, why? I said, because you need brown sugar. He says, yeah, what do you mean brown sugar? Yes, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm brown, and I'm sweet, that's brown sugar. What the world needs now more than ever is people who get out of their comfort zone to overcome the locust. Re Revival says, in those days I will pour out of my spirit and upon all flesh. I'm looking for somebody to hug right now. You don't know who you are. It's gonna be a random act of kindness. Get ready. Because love takes risk. Love and changing the world is not just liking a tweet that says something about justice or retweeting something that Dr. King said or retweeting something that Mother Teresa said. Those things are good. They highlight a reflection that is important, but much more than this kind of social media interaction. Dr. West says that justice is what love looks like in public. And so you take risk. And you walk into people's lives because to walk into somebody's life is to be touched by their weaknesses. Real love takes risk. How you doing? A Yankee fan is gonna hug a Dodger fan. This is the meaning of reconciliation. <laughs> And for so much time, Western Christianity has been about talking about it. And let me, be, let me be real with you. We need to talk about it. There comes a time where you got to be about it. And the locusts are coming and God is looking for catalysts of revival. And somebody is asking, what's love got to do with it? Well, love has everything to do with it. One of the biggest locusts of our generation is indifference. Well, that ain't about me. The hurricanes in Puerto Rico, that has nothing to do with me. Women being abused and exploited sexually in the workplace, that ain't about me. 
wildfires, that ain't about me. I'm in Florida. I'm hanging out with Brother Mickey and Sister Minnie. It is about you. Because we're Christians. And Christians transact in love. And that third locus, if the first one is indifference, if the second one is hostility, the third one is cynicism. Look at me. Look at me. There are people who actually have been fooled in believing that no matter what you do, it won't make a difference. Why should I bother? I'm just one person. Why, why should I bother? The world is always gonna get, go from bad to worse. I'm here to tell you, Gandhi once wrote and said, you have to be the change that you wanna see in the world. The Holy Spirit has empowered you to change the world. The Holy Spirit has called you to be the change agent, the catalytic agent, the hope agent. And the antidote to the locus of cynicism is the revival of hope. What is hope? What is hope? Hope is not the belief that nothing will, will ever, and nothing bad will ever happen to you. That's not hope. Bad things happen to hope-filled people. Hope is not the belief that everything you do will come out all right. Hope is the belief that no matter what you and I go through, God is always with us and God has the last word. Hope, la esperanza es la convicción de que no importa lo que tú pases en la vida, Dios está contigo. God is with you. Some years ago, I, I used to work at Princeton Theological Seminary. I ran the Hispanic programs and the Institute for Faith and Public Life. While I was at Princeton, I wrote an op-ed, an editorial about immigration and dreamers or deferred action for childhood arrivals. I wrote it, prayed over it, never thought about it. It was published. About two weeks later, my secretary, my assistant, comes into my office and says, says to me, uh, Gabe, Gabriel, somebody dropped off this letter. It didn't have any stamp on it. And so it was hand delivered to the receptionist in front of my office. On the front of the letter, it was a thick envelope, white envelope. It said, to the Reverend Dr. Gabriel, blow your horn, Salguero. I said, this is good. <laughs> I opened it. It was about 12 pieces of paper of the most vitriolic, hateful, xenophobic, racist stuff I had ever seen. You know, I was troubled. But I was more troubled when I got to the last page. And there was a picture of me, beheaded. I wish I could tell you that I felt brave, I didn't. That my inner super Puerto Rican came out. You all know that Captain America is Captain Puerto Rico, right? He just has one star? Okay. Just, just want to unpack that for you. Just want to clear some stuff up for you. When you get to heaven, you know God is Latino, right? You know God is Latino because who else would name his son Jesus and give him over to Jose and Maria? Just don't want any surprises for you. I didn't feel brave, I didn't feel courageous, I felt afraid. Because that fourth locus is fear. Fear paralyzes you. Fear paralyzes Republicans from talking to Democrats and Democrats talking to Republicans and Independents talking to both of them. Fear paralyzes us from speaking across difference of denomination. Fear paralyzes some elderly people from talking to young people and young people talking to elderly people. Fear paralyzes us from Latinos talking to African Americans and African Americans to whites and whites to Asians and Japanese to Koreans and Mexicans to Guatemalans and Puerto Ricans to Dominicans and Dominicans to Haitians and Native Americans and First Nations, fear paralyzes you because you don't know what their story is. You know what their pain is. You don't know how they're gonna get back to you. And let me tell you, I was afraid. My biggest fear was that my son, 
who was four years old at the time, was in the preschool about a mile, mile and a half from where my office. And you know what I thought when I saw that letter? I said, my goodness, the person who delivered this letter knows where I work. It wasn't mailed, it was hand delivered. I immediately called Princeton police. I called Princeton University police. I called Princeton Township police. I called Princeton Borough police. I called my cousin who was a police officer. I was afraid. And I had to call the daycare where my son was. Ironically enough, the director of that daycare, her name was Miss Wisdom. Diane Wisdom. And I said to her, Miss Wisdom, my son, my oldest son, his name is John Gabriel. I said, if anyone comes to pick up my son, absolutely under no circumstances are you to pick him up. If there's anything, are they to pick him up? If there's anything suspicious, please, please call me. And for a month, I was also pastor of a church in Manhattan at that time. For a month, I had police officers and state troopers escort me to work in my office and my son to daycare and to church. And I had a squad outside my house where my wife and I lived. Look at me, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Yo tenía miedo, I was afraid. And fear can have you lash out at people. And fear can promote anger and rage. And one day, my son, who was about four, four and a half, I'm driving, and he says to me, Daddy, why are the cops always following us? Look at me. How do you explain to a four-year-old boy that because you stood up for a Christian virtue called justice, you're in danger? See, to romanticize the work of the kingdom is one thing. To tweet about it is another thing. But to actually be afraid for your life, to have the locust in your camp, I'm gonna tell you the truth, I didn't know what to say. My eyes started welling up with tears. I, I didn't have an answer for John Gabriel. And right when I was gonna stumble through or muddle through something, my son has a great Sunday school teacher. He says to me, Daddy, is it because we did something good? I said, son, yes it is. And then he says to me two words that they repeat in his Sunday school class almost every week when he was that age. Two words that you and I need to know. In the midst of hostility, in the midst of locusts, there is a revival. The two words he says to me, he says, daddy, love wins. Tears are going down my face. And at that very moment, I began to pray for the person who threatened my life. Look at me. The world is looking for people who are locust slayers. The world is looking for young men and young women, for college students and faculty and professors who are not afraid to be the change agents, change agents who are not afraid to look evil in the face and say love has the last word, who are not afraid to stand up against uncivil discourse, who are not afraid to hug beyond barriers, to love people who are different from them, who are not afraid to sit down and reason together. The world is looking for you. Miguel de Unamuno, the famous Spanish poet, taking from a rabbi, Rabbi Hillel says, if not you, who? And if not now, when? We have two options, look at me. Tenemos dos opciones, dos opciones. We can curse the darkness or we can turn on the light. We can be angry all the time or we can be love agents to change the world. For me, I choose to turn on the light. Wherever there's despair to bring hope. Let me, let me, let me finish my story. Pastor Lisa, Chaplain Lisa, Bishop Lisa, 
in her introduction, she talked about me flying on Air Force One to talk about DACA, deferred action, about, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. That's my glory, let me tell you my story. My father was a homeless man. He was a heroin addict. Back in those days, in the 50s and 60s, they didn't call it addict, they called them junkies. Back in those days, they weren't talking a lot about the opioid crisis in America, even though young black and brown bodies were dying all over inner cities. I am so glad, I am glad, that finally the opioid epidemic is getting attention, but man, would I have loved that we paid attention to it four or five decades ago. My dad used to live under a bridge. And one day he comes to something that's called a street revival back in those days, or a street service, or a crusade service, tent revival. And while he's there, a woman is singing an old Spanish hymn, Cristo rompe las cadenas, Cristo rompe las cadenas, y nos da seguridad, Christ breaks the chains. He hears the song and he says, if this is true that Christ can change a life, I'm gonna go up there and I'm gonna have them pray for me. He comes out, they pray for him, immediately they grab him, they put him in a bus, they take him to a camp of this program called Teen Challenge. It's a drug transformation center. Dad graduates from Teen Challenge. Move 40 something years later, I'm about 40 years old, because I'm 40 now. I'm 40 years old. And I'm, I'm getting up on Air Force One. I'm, I'm going up the stairs to Air Force One. Let me tell you, I get off the car out of the Oval Office. I get off this SUV and the, and the, and the Secret Service guy who's about 6'10", 475, I mean, this guy's huge. He's like, what's your name? I'm like, Reverend Sakero. I get, I get off, I go up the steps onto Air Force One and there's another guy who's about 7'12". And he's like, what's your name? And in my, in my mind, I'm thinking, I just told that guy 10 steps ago. But in my heart, I'm like, Reverend Sagero says, you can go. I take se seven steps, I kid you not, I, I wanna just tell you, I thank you for your tax dollars because I used them that day. They had lobster, they had shrimp, you guys just blessed me. Thank you very much, this Boricua was just loving that stuff. I grew up in the projects. I was eating all that tax food. And another guy, he's 8'11", 8, 1,200 pounds of muscle. He's like, what's your name? And I'm thinking to myself, but I just, just, I just told this, you, can you ask him? But in my heart, I'm like, I'm Reverend Sagero. Finally, I get to sit down. There's a seat that says Reverend Sagero. I just want to tell you, thank you for your tax dollars. It's leather, big, you got your own phone, awesome. I'm the son of a homeless man. I'm the son of a man who learned to read in prison, who never finished eighth grade. I pick up the phone, because they told me, oh, I could call anybody I want. I was like, oh, hold up a second. I called my third grade teacher who told me I'll never be anything. I'm like, yeah, could you find this person? I'm kidding. <laughs> I called my dad. And I said, Dad, it's me, Gabe. Can you believe it? God made the son of a homeless man an advisor to presidents. Never tell me that God could not change the locust into a story of hope. I didn't just read it in a book, I lived it. Will you bow your heads and open your hearts? God, as we send these powerful young men and women into the world to face the locus of despair, of hostility, of selfishness, will you empower them with your Holy Spirit? A spirit of hope, a spirit of power, a spirit of justice, and a spirit of love. Let them be the ones the world is waiting for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. 
Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.